Welcome back everybody to another reaction video and today we're going to look at another Sabaton history. This is Fields of Verdun. Now I confess in addition to what I talked about when I reacted to the song Fields of Verdun, there's really not a lot I can add uh, that I know about the Battle of Verdun. I know a little bit here and there so I'm mostly just going to react to what's happening and kind of talk through what I'm thinking and feeling and understanding about what they're doing. Uh, don't forget please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Check out some of the links in the description below. We're doing a giveaway as well as a fundraiser uh, and so there's a lot going on right now and when we hit 10,000 subscribers there's going to be a big uh, set of giveaways so uh, the quicker we get there the quicker we can get to those giveaways. Let's dive into Fields of Verdun. The Battle of Verdun was the longest battle of the First World War, lasting over 300 days. And yet, the attacking German army was unable to break through that symbol of French national pride. And our song Fields of Verdun from our upcoming album, The Great War, is about that battle and the French slogan of courage, they shall not pass. I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Joachim from Sabaton. And this is Sabaton History. Now he's going to tell you a little bit about the song and the album, but I'm going to give you a little Verdun history lesson. In late 1915, German Army Chief of Staff Erich von Falkenheim was looking up and down the map of the Western Front. It had been more than a year since the stalemate and trench warfare had begun there. This is during the First World War. The home front was already suffering under the naval blockade, and he feared a war of attrition that the German Empire could only lose. He so this is a good point he makes about the blockade. People can't underestimate the effect on uh, German military decisions that this blockade was having, because the longer the war went on and the more the German home front suffered, not having enough food, not having enough supplies, not having enough ammunition, all of that stuff. The more that happened, the more the Germans were pressured to have to force a decisive action that would decide the war. Uh, you have to wonder if it hadn't been for the blockade of German ports, uh, how different the war on land might have gone. Needed to go on the offensive. To Falkenheim, the weakest point of the Western Front was the British sector, and attacking at Artois could, he believed, lead to a decisive breakthrough that would collapse the whole Western Front. And, and notice there, too, that this is the, uh, the thinnest part of the line in terms of the distance that the Germans had to go to reach the coast. And so there's an opportunity there to cut off uh, other units and encircle them, destroy them, shorten the front that you have to defend. If you can push, you know, if you can cut through here, encircle these troops, and then build your front line there, you, you have a sh lot shorter front that you've got to deal with. But he'd learned the hard way that without eliminating or at least tying down the French beforehand, the defense would be too strong. So to deliver the blow in the north, he would attack at a place further south that would draw in as many French forces as possible. It must be a place the enemy could not afford to lose for strategic or propagandistic purposes and would thus fight until wiped out. Such a place was Verdun. Now, it's interesting because the very reason that they, they choose Verdun is the very reason why they can't take it. Because the French were so willing to fight to the death to hold it. Uh, so it's kind of a catch-22. You want to attack a place that he's going to pour massive amounts of troops in, but then you still have to win to make it worth it. Verdun was not Falkenhayn's first choice, since it was a heavily fortified area. But it was also a commanding location. By capturing the heights east of the River Meuse and loading them with artillery, the Germans could constantly threaten the city and the local defenses, forcing the French to continuously attack the German defenses. The French would be tied down. And if they lost badly, the British would be forced to intervene. In the best case, they would hastily execute an offensive at the Somme, suffer heavy casualties as well, and open themselves up for a decisive German counterattack. Falkenhayn concluded that if Verdun was successful, there would be peace before the summer of 1916. Hmm. The key to the attack was heavy artillery. Total destruction, then attack battalions and pioneers storming the hills in a wedge toward the mighty fortress of Douaumont, taking the remnants of the other fortresses that were surely destroyed by the heavy bombardment. And as I mentioned in the other video, Douaumont is where the massive ossuary is now where you can go and literally see the, the bones of tens of thousands of soldiers who died during the battle uh, for Verdun. 
Preparations were made over the winter, massing artillery pieces of all calibers and millions of shells. The attack was planned for February once the weather cleared. On the 21st of February, the bad weather finally cleared and German aircraft and observation balloons hit the skies. At 7.12 a.m. came the order to attack. The largest concentration of guns in history to this point opened up in a violent concert, described by witnesses as the symphony of the devil. Even in the Vosch near the Swiss border could be heard the thunder of the German guns. In an intensity never seen before, the barrage destroyed whole forests, blowing trees meters high into the air and raining stones and earth on the poor souls on the ground. So you have to you have to wonder how on earth and you know maybe because of what happened in World War II, how a, a larger French army lost so rapidly to the Germans. Uh, at least here in the United States, the French get a bad rap as being weak and quick to surrender, and there's still those jokes about that. But think about uh, just what these French soldiers went through. If it was that destructive on the landscape, imagine what it did not only to the men, but to their psyche. And the fact that they were able to hold this fort for the better part of a year under that kind of bombardment says a lot about these French soldiers. Some soldiers were simply obliterated, torn apart mm. by the force of the guns. Others were buried alive deep in their trenches or bunkers. Then the German combat troops emerged from the saps with grenades, wire cutters, and flamethrowers. With the advantage of surprise, they stormed the first French lines. Through ice, rain, and snow, the soldiers fought as rifle shots and grenades burst in their midst. Trench after trench, the Germans gained a foothold, despite fierce resistance from well-camouflaged French machine guns and blockhouses. Thing is, for French Army Chief of Staff Joseph Joffre, Verdun wasn't that important, at least <laughs> militarily. If the Germans could not be held on the east bank of the Meuse, the French would retreat and build new positions on the western bank. This was what Falkenhayn feared. But Aristide Briand made it perfectly clear that losing Verdun was not acceptable. Not only would the psychological effect be disastrous for the French public, it would undermine trust in the current government. And if So this was a big deal because there were a lot of government issues here. A lot of people think that the issues with uh, the leadership was mostly a central powers issue with these empires dealing with threats to uh, overthrowing their empires. But it was an issue as well in the West, especially in France. Uh, and, and so this is not so much about military necessity holding uh, holding Verdun, but it's a political one. It's a, you know, we can't be seen to be losing. And, and if the French populace hears we lose, here we lose Verdun, this is a problem. Briand lost his job, so would Joffre. So giving up Verdun was out of the question. This is exactly what Falkenhayn had hoped for. However, though the Germans advanced the first weeks, it was not nearly as far as Falkenhayn had calculated, and the French had brought in reserves and Philippe Pétain to lead the men. The most important heights were still far away and under French control, and taking the fortress of Douaumont was the key to those heights. Unlike the big fortresses in Belgium that had quickly fallen to modern heavy artillery at the beginning of the war, the French had used a stronger special concrete for Douaumont that just would not break. And the fortress soon seemed like an island in an Shoot. ocean of fire and shrapnel. Small platoons of German soldiers that crept towards the fortress in early March found that it was actually mostly empty. And the strongest fortress of Europe was thus taken by a German officer with a pistol and a lot of guts. <laughs> Fort Douaumont is for many the symbol of the Battle of Verdun. Yeah. The Germans celebrated its fall, but Douaumont was a trap for the men inside. Every direct artillery hit put out the lights, and the men cowered in darkness for days, living in their own waste, sharing their food with rats and lice, while the stench of the dead and the screams of the wounded haunted the long corridors. But you know, this was actually still better than soldiers outside the fortress walls had to endure in the meat grinder that was Verdun. The French just had one supply road out of range of German artillery. 
only trucks for military purposes were allowed to use that road. And soon over 3,000 trucks a day wow. were bringing men, ammunition, and supplies up the road. If one broke down, it was simply pushed off the road, which became known as the Voie Sacrée, the Holy Road. Hmm. The German offensive began to drastically lose speed. The whole area of Verdun had become a maze of trenches and shell holes where death was always near. I mean that literally. This is only an area of 30 square kilometers. And see, that's the thing. That, you know, when people think about large battles that lasted for months and caused hundreds of thousands of casualties like Verdun, they think of wide fronts. They think of large areas. This was a really small small area where there was so much death in one area. I'm so curious, I would, since I want to visit this area so badly someday, I'm so curious to see, I'm sure that this area still has to show the scars of that. And I'd love to hear from somebody who's been there in the comment section below. Let me know, what does it look like today? Can you still see a lot of the remnants of the battle when you go there? The death toll grew to the hundreds of thousands. The name Verdun became synonymous with the mechanized death of the First World War. But it really bound the French together. Pétain had ordered a new rotation system where no soldier was supposed to stay longer than 10 days in the front lines before being rotated out. This is brilliant because uh, this is one of those things that we learned, especially when we, once we got to the Second World War, was the importance of, uh, and they talk about this in Band of Brothers, about how even coming just 50 yards off the front lines can do a world of good for the psyche of a soldier. And so rotating these men so they didn't spend months and months on the front lines in the trenches uh, is huge to keeping them fresh, keeping them uh, able to fight effectively. This meant most soldiers in the French army had gone through Verdun. By April, the lack of progress was turning the whole idea of the Battle of Verdun into a farce. The more reserves Falkenhayn committed to the operation, the fewer he had ready for the real attack against the British. Mm. So Falkenhayn had to choose, stop the offensive and defend the gains that were made, or keep going with the offensive, but with all available forces. Half measures were now unacceptable. He would keep up the offensive. As June arrives, Falkenhayn officially declares bleeding dry as the main aim of the offensive. But bad news now also arrives. Russian General Alexei Brusilov launches his offensive on the Eastern Front. It is a spectacular success, and Germany's ally, Austria-Hungary, might be knocked out of the war. Yep. German reinforcements bound for Verdun must instead head east immediately. So at this point, you have to, uh, if you're Falkenheim, realize that you know everything that you, you set out to do is not happening. So why keep pouring men into this? This is uh, the perfect example of doubling down on a bad idea. And more bad news, the French now have air superiority in the West thanks to the new Newport 11 planes and air-to-air -air Lancia rockets. Time seems to be running out for a German victory at Verdun. Falkenhayn launches what he hopes is the final attack towards Fort Vaux and the heights around the village of Fleury. On the 7th of June, Fort Vaux falls, a victory for the Germans for sure. But is this the turning point at Verdun? Not quite for Fort Souville still stands in the way of victory, and this the Germans cannot take. June marks the limit of their advance at Verdun. On June 23rd, French General Robert Nivelle gives his famous order, Vous ne les laisserez pas passer, mes camarades, which was later shortened to, Ils ne passeront pas. They will not pass. You Indeed, they do shall not pass. So we talked about this after the other one. Uh, just down the road from there is the battle going on at the Somme. And one of the people who was there is J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, who later writes Lord of the Rings. And uh, as we also talked about with uh, what happened with the, um, the battle uh, for Vienna, um, obviously he was impacted by what happened here and, and you can see that in that moment in lord of the rings with gandalf saying you shall not pass not the french hold out in june 
And on July the 1st, the British relief attack begins at the Somme. The pressure there forces German reserves away from Verdun to the north. With the Russians still advancing in the east, there are no options for Falkenhayn available. He must dig in at Verdun as the three largest battles in history to this point all rage simultaneously. Mm. But by August, Pitan has a 7 to 1 advantage in artillery, and the German positions are pounded day and night. And as if things aren't bad enough, Romania joins the Allies. A new front and hundreds of thousands of new enemies emerge overnight for the Germans. Falkenhayn has lost the confidence of his Kaiser and then loses his job. Yep. Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff take over running the German army. That and not only running the German army, but it basically becomes a military dictatorship where they're really kind of running the country uh, by the end of the war. Of course, does not mean that the battle is simply over, but it is France's turn to attack. Pitan brings in two 40 centimeter caliber railway guns to fire 900 kilo shells. Jeez. That's around a ton each on Fort Du Almon, which finally cracks. Could you imagine? Eight months after its fall, the French retake the fort in early November, and their counterattack is relentless. What the Germans captured over months of fighting, the French now retake in mere hours. By the end of 1916, the front lines are nearly back where they were in February. For a few kilometers of land, hundreds of thousands of men have died. Jeez. The Battle of Verdun lasted 303 days and nights. Estimates of the total casualties run as high as one million men, though it was likely closer to 700,000. But still, <laughs> it was the longest battle of the First World War. And for many of the war's soldiers, it was the epitome of brutal, mechanized modern war. Many veterans would later remember Verdun by its smell, the mixture of gas, huh bodies that lay for months unburied, and the mass graves that were churned up by artillery fire. Corpses that laid for months in the dead zones of no man's land were mummified. The faces frozen in their final expression before death. Wow. The soldiers advancing into the forward trenches often had to stomp over the corpses and body parts of their dead comrades. Only the flies and rats thrived at Verdun in 1916. Before Joachim talks about the song, I would like to spoil the moment with a side note. It has been accepted history for a century that Falkenhayn's intention was to bleed France dry at Verdun, but this may not be the case. Falkenhayn claimed that this was his plan from the get-go, and he wrote about it in his 1915 Christmas memorandum to the Kaiser. However, the Kaiser never mentioned such a memorandum, and there's no actual evidence that it ever existed. Mm. Falkenhayn may well have made all of this up as an excuse after the fact to explain away his failure. I did a whole episode about the Falkenhayn controversy on the Great War Channel. The link is in the description. And now, back to... All right, so let me know your thoughts about all of that. Uh, let's have a conversation uh, about the Battle of Verdun. And uh, please hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching.